I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. No matter how hard you try raising your children, the reality is your kids do not need perfect parents. The old paradigms of parenting have changed, and after years of study and experience, our next guest has uncovered some new truths surrounding the struggle of the ages. Stephen James, licensed professional counselor, is the founder and executive director of Sage Hill Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Before starting Sage Hill, Stephen worked in private practice for more than a decade. He also works with professional C-suite executives and entrepreneurs to help them not only lead with greater confidence, clarity, integrity, and sustainability, but also to improve their family lives at homes. He's the best-selling author of five books, including Wild Things, The Art of Nurturing Boys. And he and his wife, Heather, live in Nashville, Tennessee and have four children. And he's here to talk to us about his new book, Parenting with Heart, co-authored with his good friend Chip Dobb, How Imperfect Parents Can Raise Resilient, Loving, and Wise-Hearted Kids. Stephen James, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much. Glad to be with you. Well, we're delighted to have you and uh, glad we got you rescheduled. We had some technical difficulties on the schedule from last year, but we've got all that worked out. Uh, before we get into uh, who you are today, I'd kind of like to take a back trip to who you are when you were being parented and, okay. and what that was like for you because our paradigms are usually formed by the parenting we received. So our... Yes, yeah. our our faith system, our moral system, our system of uh, ethics, uh, right and wrong, good and bad, uh, hard lines, soft lines, black and white, gray, all of that is formed in those formative years, including our faith journey. So I'd like to take you back and have you kind of share your story with us. Wow, we're going to get real personal right off the, right we off the are. beginning. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, really what we're learning through a lot of science right now is a lot of that's even established in the first 18 months of life, that, that the attachment a child has with mom and dad, um, but the most, really primarily mother, has a, does a lot to shape the child and who they are. So for me, I grew up in a, in a family. Um, I, have a, I have a mom and a dad. Uh, I have a sister, a younger sister. I'm the oldest child. Um, we grew up very middle class. Um, uh, we had a house out near the airport. I like to say that kind of describes our family growing up. I had cousins that lived right around the, the corner. Um, and so I would spend my afternoons playing until the streetlights came on when I was supposed to come at home. And I remember my first sleepover at my cousin's house around the corner. I got scared in the middle of the night, so I just got up and left in the middle of the night, didn't tell anybody, and walked home about 3 in the morning. So it was that kind of neighborhood. It wasn't quite Mayberry, but it was. It, I felt safe and cared for and uh, my dad worked hard, and uh, my mom was available and present to us, uh, and things seemed pretty normal for me um, as a child. I had, uh, you know, my first faith experiences really came through my grandmother, who sang in the choir at our church, and she would let me sit in the pews with her behind a column uh, so, the, so the congregation couldn't see me, but I would sit next to her in the alto section, and that's kind of where I really had my first experience of God as a young child, is, is hearing her croon these awful, she had a terrible voice, but she loved to sing, right? So I would just, she, she would sing with so much faithfulness. And so things seemed really um, good, you know, in, in my childhood as a, as a young child. As I got older, uh, my family, the, the seams began to pull at my family, uh, the stress of life. And, and I think a lot of my parents' own emotional baggage began to show up in their marriage and begin to stress our family out. Uh, and my parents ended up divorcing when I was 17 years old. And a lot of family secrets have uh, came out in that period and have continued to come out over the last 30 years um, uh, about just really what was going on behind the scenes in their lives and, um, and really, you know, kind of speaks to some of the lack of, uh, well, I had, a, I think, a very loving family. There's a lot of foundational things that went missing um, in my family growing up. And I, I carried those things into my own marriage, um, a lot of my own insecurities, a lot of my own shame, uh, a lot of uh, my own coping mechanisms that I developed as a child to kind of cope with the anxiety and the insecurity of what seemed like on the surface a good family, but 
uh, well, it was a good family, but underneath it was a very human family, and we didn't have the language or the confidence or the ability to talk about about the hard harder things of life in my family growing up. And so, um, you know, I, I married uh, Heather Young right out of college. Uh, the day after I graduated college, I got married, and we we started trying to create for ourselves a um, a family. And I was pretty much play acting at that point. I was carrying out what I thought a husband was supposed to do and a father was supposed to do. And, but I wasn't really being myself. And I remember when she got pregnant for the first time, uh, which we'll find out later was our daughter. I was just scared to death because I knew personally, I didn't have what it takes. I wasn't prepared to be a parent and I wasn't prepared to, to, give this child what she needed from me because I didn't have it to give myself. And, you know, I, I believed in Jesus. I was teaching Sunday school. I was, uh, you know, faithful churchgoer and worshiper of Christ. But deep inside, there was shame and secrets and pain that I've not, not yet dealt with. And that was coloring my perception of the world, my perception of myself. And, um, you know, and so I think talk about what my parents gave me. They gave me uh, a sense of belonging, and they also gave me a sense of anxiety. Uh, and I think I spent a lot of my adult life trying to reconcile those things together. Stephen, for our audience that shares a similar background, so that they can recognize in themselves how these things manifest, how yeah. you talk about shame, and we have Dr. Mark Baker, who is a featured guest on our program, who is a shame expert. He's yeah. built his practice on overcoming shame, and he's a regular contributor here on with us every month to talk about this very important issue that's bubbled up on the, on the priority list to hit the top three or four major psychological issues that yeah. are facing people. And uh, as your insecurities played out, how were you able to recognize uh, and how can we get our audience to kind of examine themselves and saying, wait a second, I, 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 I kind of understand what he's talking about, but what does that actually look like and how does that play out in my parenting and in my marriage and in my faith walk? Those are, that, that's such a, man, what a deep and broad question. So let me see if I can first define shame and just a real layman sense of the word, okay? Uh, Chip and I talk about there's two kinds of shame. There's a healthy shame, which is humility, a sense of understanding my gifts and my limitations, of accepting you and your gifts and your limitations, of an acknowledgement that, uh, as David says in the Psalms, that I am God's crowning achievement in glory. I made a little bit less than the angels than themselves, and I'm not God. I, I am, right, so it's a real sense of humanness is healthy shame. Then there's a toxic shame, right, which is the belief that my performance is my worth, right, and the greater I perform and the more I can, good I can do and the, uh, the better I can make you feel about me, the better off I am, right? And that's a sense of toxic shame because it promises that my worth is only as good as my next deed. And... So my, my, my sense of worth comes from what I do, not whose I am. And as, a, as a, uh, a creation of God, I belong to God and Christ. And so, you know, healthy shame, I'm knitted in that. My toxic shame says that I can only be loved for my performance and my worth comes from what I can do for you, right? And we all grow up in families and in systems, a culture, that has a, probably a little bit of both, right? That has a sense of being accepted for who we are and has a sense of being accepted for how we perform, you know? And so none of us escape a, a sense or a world where our identity is not formed by shame because shame comes online at a, about 18 months old. And it is the, the ability to accurately read another person. It's the foundation of empathy, right? And so I can read your face as a 18 to 20 month year old child. I can look at mom and I can see like, Okay, is she happy with me or is she not happy with me, right? And I will start shaping myself into who I need to be in order to make my parents happy, okay? And that's not all bad. It's not all good either, right? That's just a normal human way of development. Uh, for me, 
um, that meant in my family growing up that there were certain things I could talk and be around my mom in a certain way, and there were certain ways I could be around my dad, but they weren't the same way. I had to play a certain role with with those people. With my mom, we could talk about certain things. With my dad, we couldn't talk about certain things. With my dad, we could just have an easy day. With my mom, there was always a sense of intensity right around. And so I had to kind of learn to shift who I was in order to be part of my family, right? Which means that I couldn't really be my true self, you know? And I think that's kind of true for all of us. We all play different roles in our lives, you know? And, um, and that's, there's a skill in that, but the foundation, there's a sense of a belief that begins to be accepted that, that who I am is not really acceptable, you know, and I'm not loved for who I, who I genuinely am. And that, and that, and it, it kind of goes, we finish this thought and maybe, maybe you could ask a, a question that would help the listeners. Um, that all of us experience a sense of abandonment in our lives, that we reach out for love, care, uh, to a parent or to God, and we get a sense of someone not reaching back, right? And that feels like abandonment or, or betrayal, you know, which is the deepest human, human wound that we can experience is even deeper than abuse is abandonment or betrayal. Um, and so we decide in that that some little children can't decide that, well, something's wrong with my parents. They're having a bad day. A little child decides when they reach out and no one reaches back, something must be wrong with me. You know, and that child internalizes that belief. And then the world confirms that belief. There is something wrong with you. You're not just deficient because we're all deficient. right? We're all, we don't all carry all the gifts of everything. We're all deficient. But we decide that our deficiencies make us defective, and there's something uniquely, specially broken about me. And if you knew that thing, you would reject me too, right? And so we start trying to create an outward appearance of a human self that would make ourselves acceptable to others, primarily our parents, you know. Um, and that's the human dance that's been going on since the very, very, very beginning, right? That's 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 Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. You know, all the way through, I mean, Jesus kind of overturns that in the temple when and he leaves his parents, his parents leave him behind and he's talking to the rabbis and they got all worried and come back and they're like, where are you? And he's like, didn't you know where I was going to be? You knew I would be here. This, these are, you know, this is where I belong. Like, like this dance between mother and child and father and child and trying to live up to parents' expectations is the, one of, is the oldest human story. It's every movie we, we see, it's, you know... Um, and so I'm not, I don't think what I'm saying is shocking. I think it's common, right? And as parents, we either perpetuate that myth, right, which is trying to make our children something more perfect than we had, which puts a lot of pressure on our children, or we accept our children as humans, and we accept ourselves as humans, and we enter into a, a human relationship that's not so outcome-based about manufacturing good humans, right? But it's about uh, growing wise-hearted people who have compassion, wisdom, and hope that they can offer the world. You know, what's interesting about what you're saying is in a performance-based environment, there's either success or failure. Yeah, either well you've said. Either you've accomplished or you have not accomplished the task at hand. Yeah. And uh, we've done that to Christianity. That we have, oh, we have check yes. bar, we have this checkbox Christianity. Uh, are you doing this? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you coming to? Are you tithing? Are you doing? And we have this this checkbox Christianity. And if you don't get all the checkbox, then you're a failure as a Christian. We have and, whole systems of Christian doctrine that are about shame-based, performance-based identity. Yeah. Right. Guilt. Listen, I yep. come from a people who invented it. <laughs> Right. We perfected it over a six thousand yeah. year period. Yes. Um, we we initi- the law code that confirms it, right? The, the law, right? Exactly. So yeah. so um, and then the Catholics hijacked it from us. <laughs> yeah, right? They made and, it even better. Right. And, and took it and took it to a whole new level. Uh, yeah. So uh, certainly, my Jewish mother would like me to pray to her. I, yeah. And of course, she thinks I'm God, but that's very typical. <laughs> that's very typical in a Jewish family. Yeah, so it's, it's no in a southern family too. Southern right. Christian family, it's very yeah. similar. You know, so it's yeah. no wonder that Jesus was Jewish and that Mary gets all the play. So you know, <laughs> he does his first miracle. I heard a 
comedian talk one time that Jesus's first miracle was when his mother guilted him into turning the water to wine. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. And that's and that's how you know when you ask Jewish the question. Mother. Yeah. When you ask the question, was Jesus really Jewish? You say, you know, look at the mother. <laughs> That's all you have to do is look at the mother. Oh, it's great. So we've, we've created this environment. And, um, you know, I come from what people would say the baby boomer generation. But because I'm Jewish, it's more reference the post, first post-Holocaust generation. Okay. We, were, we, were the re, we were the replenishment of the Jewish population that had been depleted by six million, by one third. And yeah. we carried that mantle of our Jewish identity, of, of being Jewish and, and being involved in the restoration of the Jewish population of the world. And in that, there were the same Old Testament requirements of you're not going to date outside the faith, you're not going to go to school outside the faith, you're not going to have friends outside the faith. And so we were very insulated from Christianity. Jesus was the God of the Gentiles. I thought that uh, the Lutheran church, that Lex Luther was the head of the Lutheran church. Um, I found out that the Episcopal church had the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. I thought they used the Canterbury Tales as their Bible. Uh, I, I li I'd lived in this little Jewish bubble where I had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever. Uh, but um, this was performance-based. You had to maintain... Yeah. This, you had to be a good Jewish boy uh, and act in a good Jewish manner. We had cotillion and dance school and bar mitzvah classes and, and uh, ethics classes and, and how to be a good Jew. And, and, and those codes aren't bad. No, like, not at all. How to be a good person. There's actually standards, right, that we have that, that we don't steal, we don't lie, we don't cheat, right? Those are good things, but when my identity comes from me keeping those standards, right? It's a ladder to nowhere, you know, that just keeps on going because I can't climb the higher, la the, that shame ladder high enough to be successful because there's always more ladder and there's always more people on it. My joke is, you know, it, there's always, it, rich people have planes and John Travolta's got a 747, right? He's got, there's always a bigger plane. Right. You know, um, the president's got Air Force One, right? There's always, a, there's always some other standard to compare ourselves to. You know, and when love is based in that standard, we're lost. When, when you're raised in an environment that if you break one of these laws, you break all of these laws. Yeah. When you are raised in an environment where it's an all or nothing proposition, it is a setup for failure. Yes. And it strives for perfection, which manifests itself in later life as demanding of perfection of your children. Yes. And so in the opening remarks, um, we talked about the fact that uh, the new reality is your kids do not need perfect parents. No, they can't have them. All right. <laughs> it's impossible to have a perfect parent. Right. And so, you know, we can uh, modern psychology, of which I'm a fan and student of, uh, you know, is a fairly new idea. That, that we can treat humans in a certain way and they'll come out the other end another way. And so this, the word parenting did not really come into vogue until the 1950s. It was not even an idea that we had that you could apply techniques to a child that would then guarantee results on the back end. It's really an industrialization of parenting of how we raise children. And, and so it really put pressure on parents to try to become this perfect parent that could do it right so their child would not have to wrestle with life. So it comes out of a good place that I want my child to not have to deal with the life I've dealt with. I want them to not to go through the hardships and the pain and the difficulty. And if I just do the right things for them, then their life will be easier for me. But at the core, that's just idolatry, right? This, because life's not that way. Creation's broken. It is going to be struggle. It is going to be suffering. There is going to be joy and beauty. But when we try to keep our children from the struggle instead of teaching them how to struggle— and how to stay in the struggle, we've set them up for a performance-driven life and, a, and some false promise that, that they're not successful unless they don't have problems. You know, and I've not yet met a child or an adult that doesn't have problems. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> we all, we, 
we all struggle and life is difficult. And even when we're doing good things, bad things happen. You know, I was born, born in the early 50s. And of course, the guideline was Dr. Spock. I don't even think, yeah. he, had, I don't even think he had children. Uh, <laughs> but he wrote a book on parenting. And this was, you know, uh, and you get to the page that says that um, if, you're, if, if by the time your child is two, they haven't fallen off a of bed, then you're watching them too closely. Uh, you know, those were some of the practical applications. Yeah. Uh, but the concepts of nurturing were not involved. It was performance-based. It was really actually in our world, uh, in the Jewish community, it was outsourced. Uh, yeah. Parenting was outsourced. We had someone who was a caregiver in the home that came and watched us while our parents, my father went to work, my mother went to whatever she did, and there was somebody who was employed that would be there when we got home from school. Uh, and they were the ones that prepared a snack and, and helped out with the, the dinner meal and then went off to their yeah. own home and had their own life, and that was their, that was their role. And as far as uh, you were to be seen and not heard, uh, spoken, you spoke when you were spoken to, um, you couldn't talk about how you didn't like Brussels sprouts because you were told about children starving all over the world that wish yeah. they wish they had a Brussels sprout and uh, you were to eat what was in front of you and you didn't question it and you was everything was wait till your father got home and that's when the system kicked in and there were you know you went and got your father a glass of water and you went and and he came in and you gave him 10 minutes where nobody talked to him so that he could go and decompress and when he came down the stairs now he was approachable and there was this whole system it was very regimented uh, very regulated until he went to his chair and he sat down in his chair and the glass of water was given to him and that's when he was then present and uh, you could have uh, the questions were limited to um, maybe how was school or uh, what is this that your mother told me that you did? Yeah. You know, that was the extent of interaction at the parental level in the 50s. So, yeah. And then we flipped to the other side where it became very, that was just a very parent centric model, right? Where the family revolved around the parent, right? And then in the later, you know, in the probably late 70s, early 80s, we switched to a child centric model where the family revolved around the child. And it became this child worship model, right? Where, and neither one of those hold water, right? Both both leave um, the first leaves children with a lot of anxiety uh, to perform well, right? And the second leaves children with a lot of anxiety to to perform well, um, so that the parents will be okay. Like in the first model, if they don't perform well, they're not okay. They're not part of the system, right? In the second model, the, in the child centric home where all the focus is on Johnny and Janie. Are they happy? Are they successful? Are they making good grades? Are they in the right school? Are they in the right church? Like, you know, are they tying their shoe at the right time? Are they hitting all their milestones? Or, you know, um, that puts a lot of pressure on the child because the child intuitively knows that if I don't succeed, my mom and dad are going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that's a real difficult uh, weight for a child to carry. You know, is the weight, the emotional weight of my parents stability you know and and so this this you know, we've and these aren't new ideas right the, i think families throughout time have fallen into a couple of these models what we argue in this book and kind of promote and encourage is that is that um, parents have a, a a real role with children but it's to help children learn how to be themselves right not fulfill the parents wishes because the child can't and not make up for the parent's lost childhood because the child can't, right? But help the child live the child's life that God's written for them. And that's a real different approach. You know, I, I tell a story in the book about uh, my, my children in sports. Like, I was a Division I athlete. I coached college soccer. Uh, I had, sports were something I found for me as a child that, that, and as a young adult that were— um, uh, camaraderie and belonging and success and identity and it was just a wonderful place for me to learn and grow and there were some bad things that happened there too but it, overall it was a really good thing so you know when I started having children I had dreams and hopes of being their coach 
and of them growing up and playing sports, right? So I've got four kids, none of them play sports, right? You know, they're, they're wonderful people, and they know I'm disappointed and sad, you know, because my eyes light up around the talk of my nephew's soccer game. It's like, oh, let's go watch them play, you know? And, uh, but they know that that's about my story, and they know that it's okay for them not to play sports, right? right. Um, and we can have those conversations, and, and they can uh, let their story disappoint their father because they know their father can handle disappointment, right? And they can go live their own life. Um, and I can walk with them through their life and help them live their life, not fulfill my dreams and wishes of their life. And this is the essence of this book, Parenting with Heart, We're talking with Stephen James, co-author with Chip Dodd of this breakthrough book, How Imperfect Parents Can Raise Resilient, Loving, and Wise-Hearted Kids, Setting Their Own Agenda Aside But Adopting God's agenda and God's design for each one of these children because he has uniquely gifted them yeah. and we are the ones who are supposed to be polishing the silver not creating the silver or refining the silver but polishing it so that it can be the luster that it, God designed it to mm. be. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to dig into the text of this book and some of the concepts such as what is the spiritual root system and how it relates to Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10, and how it is that God gives us a beautiful biblical model for parenting. We'll be right back. Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach revealing prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.IgnitingAnation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting a Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. 
The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Stephen James, co-author of Parenting with Heart, How Imperfect Parents Can Raise Resilient, Loving, and Wise-Hearted Kids. Stephen, welcome back to the program. Thanks. When we went to break, we talked about, uh, referenced in the book, you talk about the spiritual root system and how it relates to Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10, which is kind of a foundational scripture for this book and for this concept. Talk to us a little bit about that system. Yeah, so the spiritual root system is a construct that Chip developed about 20 years ago as a way of understanding the human heart, right? And, and the foundation of it is a statement that says, you and I are created as emotional and spiritual creatures created to live fully in relationship, and our, our full living only comes through relationship. So we're, we're image bearers of God, God's a relational God. So we're created in relationship to live fully, me with me, relationship with myself, me with you, and me with God and God's creation. That, that in living out the fulfillment of those relationships, um, that I will live fully. That is the meaning and purpose of life. And that, uh, that the, and the image we use in that is that there's a tree with five roots, and if those roots are fed, the tree will flourish, right? And if the, root is, if the roots are not fed what, the, what they need to live, the, the tree will survive, the heart will survive. It's a picture of the human heart, and the five roots are feelings, needs, desires, longings, and hope. Those are the five roots of the human heart, and they're fed through relationship, right? Just like a, uh, Chip tells a story of if you, if you plant a human being in a pot of soil and put water and sunshine on it, it will die. <laughs> Right, but if you put a tree in a pot of soil and put water and sunshine on it, it will grow. Right, so he, the the thing that feeds humans is relationship, and we are we are made for relationship. We're made through relationship, by relationship. You know, and that's that's how we know ourselves and how we know God and how we know others. Um, and so the image that we use for that is Jeremiah 17, and it's this it's this dialogue between Jeremiah the prophet and God, and and uh, Jeremiah says to God, you know, like, help me understand. And, and God says, uh, you know, blessed is the person who is planted, uh, blessed is the man who is like a tree planted by the stream of living water, who sends out its roots, it will always bear fruit, in times of drought it will always be green, right? It's, it's that even in hard times this person's life will be generous. And then cursed is the one who is like a bush in the wasteland, right? And cursed means isolated. And so God lays out this beautiful poetry and these two pictures of, of a tree bearing fruit and then a shrub that's, that's, that's trying to survive all on its own, right? And then Jeremiah says, but well, okay, we all know this. I'm paraphrasing gospel here, the scriptures here. Um, we all know this, but we all know that this is the way, so why do we all choose this? You know, the heart is deceitful. It's sick. It's beyond cure. Who can understand this, God? Like, we all know this is the way to live fully, is to be this first kind of tree, but we all end up doing a version of the second kind of tree. Like, go figure. Why do we do that? And then God answers Jeremiah and says, I, God, search the heart. I, I go to the innermost being of everybody, and I, I grant them a reward or give them what they need there, right? And so what the spiritual root system is is a way of kind of taking that picture from Jeremiah 17 and saying, okay, if you feed the heart— on relationship, through feelings, needs, desires, longings, and hope, that heart will grow big. That person's self will grow rich, and they will be able to be generous, and they will be able to give to people even in times of hardship. But if if the person doesn't feed those roots through relationship, they will end up being a survivor, 
and they, they will just cling to life and try to scrap out an emotional and spiritual existence of survival, right? Because we can do that. You know, human beings are really good at surviving. Um, and the problem with living through our feelings and our needs and our desires and our longings and our hope is that those things are painful. That, is that because life is tragic, uh, living life on life's terms is, means that life is painful and, and, and feelings hurt and needs hurt and desire hurts and longings ache. And hope is this thing that's not fulfilled, right, that, that we live with every day. That is, in some ways, humans' greatest problem is hope because we can't get over the, the belief and the possibility that, that uh, Christ will come again or the world will re- be remade the way it's supposed to be, right? And that's, but it's not there yet, right? So we live in this place. And so to live life on life's terms means we have to live with the recognition that life is tragic. But we also live with the truth that God is faithful. Right? That God is doing and working and active, even in the midst of the tragedy. That those, the tragedy is not meaningless. You know? and, and to live in that place means we have to be well-rooted in relationship with ourselves other than God. And that's the spiritual root system, is, is naming our feelings, you know, which open us up to our neediness and our dependence. Right? It's not feelings for the sake of feelings. It's feelings to open us up to our neediness and our dependence, which lead us to our desire you know, and our, our energy to create and move and do. And then our longing, which is the, the things that are the pictures that are in us of the way life is supposed to be. That, you know, it's the, seeing a sunset and kind of that ache of wanting to move into the sunset or that sense of looking out at the stars and going like, oh, I'm part of this thing. That's all speaking to the longing of what we were made for, of eternity and bigness. And then that takes us to the hope of, like, yeah, we're made for that. And I can't keep wanting that and hoping for that and aching for that in the present, my present life. And so really to, to live a, as a full-hearted human is to live with the problems of life, you know, and to live with the ache of life and, and the, the joy of life. And joy is one of the worst things we can encounter, right, because all joy is. Like, it comes and it goes, and it's like, ah. Oh. You know, so a lot of us have these artificial joys and these short joys, right? And so uh, that's, the, that's the spiritual root system we use. That's the picture. That's the tree on the front is a picture of a tree that's got roots growing deep. And, um, you know, and it's an image that we use all the time to talk about the roots of the heart. And, and as a parent, specifically in this, our, our, our role and our responsibility is to feed the child the relationship the child needs and to honor the child's feelings, to honor the child's desires and longings and needs, not knowing that you might not be able to fulfill them all, right? That, that it's not a parent's job to fulfill all their child's needs, but to honor them and respect that they have them is really important. If, if one of the foundational needs of every person is affirmation and confirmation, Yes then how do we keep from going overboard with participation awards and making sure that every child feels affirmed and confirmed and strike this false balance? There's, I hear parents say, you know, I love all my kids the same. And I say, no, you don't. No, you okay? don't. It, it, that's not true. Yeah. All right? You don't love all your kids the same. You don't treat all your kids the same. If you do that, then you're painting them with the same brush. Therefore, you're parenting from a paradigm that says that um, I have this universal parenting style. It applies and I have no individual children. Yeah. Where parenting with heart recognizes the individuality of the child and feeds them the nourishment that their roots need in order for them to thrive, yeah. giving them a different environment. You know, the cactus planted by uh, the stream of living water right, uh, may not perform the same way it does in its ecosystem of going deep into the surface That's of well the said. sand to find uh, if it's right there, does the cactus flourish by the water? No, the eucalyptus flourishes by the water. There are other plants, the, the reed flourishes by the water, but the acacia flourishes in the desert. Yeah. Uh, so if we take a look at, at God using things of the natural 
to yeah. reveal supernatural truth to us, then we should not be treating our kids the same. No. We should not be loving them the same. And we should be finding ways to uniquely affirm and confirm them yeah. without going this way of this false balance that winds up being the world standard of, you know, every child should get an award. Um, you, you know, you didn't come in 42nd. Um, you know, you, 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 uh, you know, here, you know, you, you tried really hard. No, you came in 42nd and there were yeah. only, and there were only 41 people in the race. <laughs> and you tried really hard. And you tried really hard. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Next, next, next time, um, get a number, sign up, and get in the race, because I can't give you because there weren't forty-two. Uh, you didn't. Yeah. You didn't even try. Uh, but you have parents that are doing that. Then you have parents who are stri driving their kids to this perfection because they feel that uh, in this new environment where you're hearing things like a college education is no longer the driving force. In my generation, uh, no degree, no job. And yeah. th that was it. If you, if you didn't go to college, you were going to be a crane operator. Uh, you were going to be a truck driver. That was what was going to befall you. So you had to go on, and everybody went to college. Uh, I remember that at Penn State, you either had to be able to read or write, but you didn't have to do both in order <laughs> to be accepted at the university. Um, you know, but, but if you were a resident of the state of Pennsylvania, you were automatically granted acceptance in the state university. Wow. Uh, that was basically, if you graduated high school, you got into college. Uh, yeah. You know, that was, that was the, because that was the environment that we were in. And yeah. The, and the fact that there were 55,000 students on campus, um, you know, I still go back to what do you call a man who graduated last in his medical school class? Doctor. You, exactly. So, um, you know, do you strive for excellence? Do you, you know, if, if we're or looking... Integrity, right? like that's or integrity, right? Or integrity, exactly. What, what becomes the system which imperfect parents can raise resilient, loving, and wise-hearted children? Um, yeah. You alluded to something which we often refer to in marriage, and that's a cord of three strands. Mm -hmm. And that is the parent, the child, it, it's usually in the marital ceremony, it's the husband, the wife, and Jesus in the middle. But the same quarter three strands applies to parenting, where it's the parent, the child, and the Lord in the center, which is going to be an unbreakable cord. And that's what you introduce yeah. in this is parenting with heart. It's not just with your heart, it's understanding the heart of the father for his children and being able to pass the heart of the father for his children as an ambassador of God onto your child as the example because that formative years in establishing you as a father are the God identity that that child will carry with them and see whether or not they feel affirmed, confirmed, and loved. Yeah, we do. the greatest human need, the way God created us, is to belong and matter. And we, as relational creatures, that there's no greater need we carry inside of us than belonging and mattering. More than food, clothing, and shelter, which we learn in school were the greatest human needs. But we see in our grown-up world that people will go without food. They'll, they'll uh, risk clothing and shelter. They'll risk economic security in order to belong and matter. They'll join cults. They'll join gangs they'll join country clubs which are just fancy cults like they'll do these things to belong and matter right uh and so that's our core need and and if a but a parent has to first know that they belong and matter if they can't give their child that and, and god throughout all time and specifically through jesus and his resurrection is saying you belong and matter to me I will go to hell and back for you. I, I care about you. I want you. I want relationship with you, right? And if a parent doesn't really believe that, that, that and doesn't really internalize that God is crazy about them, God longs for, for redemption for them and reconciliation with them and, and uh, 
gave his own son over to death in order to have that with them. The parent doesn't really get that, right, and believes that, that, uh, that they have to perform for God's love or perform for their own self-worth, right, then they're going to hand that to their child. Right? And that usually comes from a place of secrets and shame from our own childhoods that, that we've not yet dealt with, that we need to deal with. But let's say a parent has. Let's say a parent has done their work of emotional and, and spiritual healing and maturity, and then they're, they're raising these little creatures called humans, and they're engaging with these humans. And I love what you said, that, that uh, you know, our children are never what we wish they would be. You know, um, they're always different. Like I might have wanted a juniper and I got a cactus, right? And so it, re it requires me to be a human parent and a clumsy person, right? So we talk about it. In the, we wanted to name the book uh, Giraffes on Ice is what the, the working title was the book was. Uh, the publisher hated that title. Uh, hmm. So we, they get to name it. We, we come up with Parenting with Heart, which I think is a great title too. But the giraffes on ice is this picture of the best we get as humans is like a giraffe running on ice, like clumsy and gangly. And I always picture like a giraffe with a scarf going over. It's just kind of like barely skating, barely making it. And if we can, with our children, kind of be willing to be clumsy, what we're saying to them is we're living life on life's terms. And kid, it's okay for you to live life on life's terms because, look, for me, I'm 45. I, I'm just now learning how to do 45. You know, like I don't know how to do 45. Um, I, I can help my, my son do 15 or six, he's 16. My oldest son is 16. I can help him do 16, but things have changed a lot in 30 years. Like his 16 is different than my 16. And even if it was exactly the same, he's a different kid. You know, our, our daughter is off at college uh, right now, our oldest child. And the things she's encountering in college are really different than the things I encountered in college. I worked to pay my way through school. You know, I had two jobs, went to college, you know, uh, played soccer in college. I just had a real different experience. She's got an academic scholarship. You know, she's grown up in a different family. Like what she needs from a parent as a 19-year-old woman is really different than what I needed as a 19-year-old man, Right. Um, but if I don't recognize that and then move in clumsily with her, right, then how is she going to learn how to move into her life as a clumsy 19-year-old? You know, because uh, Chip says this all the time. It takes a lifetime to learn how to live. We never get life figured out. Right. You know, and that's the ultimately what the encouragement of this book is to parents is, is look, lean into being clumsy with your children. Like, make a mess of it with them. Let them make a mess of it and be with them in it. Because uh, life is messy. And, you know, you go back to the very first story in Scripture of Adam and Eve, and it's a mess. And from Genesis 3 to about Revelation 9, it's just a giant mess. You know, it's, it's good people making terrible decisions, God picking prostitutes and tax collectors and all the fishermen and shepherds and like really just the worst of the worst to kind of lead the charge of his people, carpenters. I mean, these, these are not like the pinnacle of, of society that God's picking to kind of lead his charge, right? These are, these are clumsy, sweaty, smelly, forgotten people, you know? And, and, and that, that whole story of the Bible is a story of, of just a, a mess of people and a loving God interacting over and over and over again. And God continuing to make a way for relationship with his people. And as parents, if we embody that idea, um, it doesn't mean we don't have boundaries. We need to have boundaries. We need to have standards. We need to have values. There are things that are acceptable and not acceptable. We're not saying that. But we are saying that, that helping your child live the human experience to its fullest in all of its glory and all of its heartache is the responsibility of the parent. And when we try to give them the prize that they don't, that they didn't win, really, that's a really actually selfish stance on the parent because it says, I don't want to deal with your disappointment because I don't know how. So I'm just going to give you this trophy so that you feel better because I don't, I don't want to feel bad. Right. It's really a, a covert act of the parent to not have to feel bad for themselves. And then that's going to become the paradigm that they carry into parenting of the next generation. And we yes. have a responsibility as, as parents not to raise children.
but to raise mothers and fathers and husbands and wives. And we say in the book, you're raising a 50-year-old is what you're raising. That's exactly right. You know? That's exactly right. And, and, and that, you want that's, your, that's your, a, your proof as a parent is if you engaged well and full heartedly, you won't see until the, your child is 50 or 60 years old. Right. And then you'll get to sit back and go, oh, OK, like they've got what it takes. Like I did it like I I had what it, I gave them themselves. I, I gave them my heart and I was imperfect. And, and I think, you know, telling the truth to your children, look, I'm not everything you need. You know, uh, we tell a story in the book. I think Chip tells it about his mom. His mom says to him, when he's a little boy, like this is the first time I've done this. Like, I've never raised a kid before, right? I need your help a little bit. Not like, save me, but like, look, you're an eight-year-old boy. I've never raised an eight-year-old boy, you know? And if I have, like, you're a different eight-year-old boy. So help me out here. Uh, I tell the story in the book of my children fighting over a stuffed animal when they were had uh, four children. I think our youngest at this age were we have three year, they were three year old twin boys and we had a five year old boy the five year old and one of the three year olds are fighting over a stuffed animal, and so I was going to implement some biblical parenting, so I asked one of them to go give me some scissors and I held up the stuffed animal and I'm going to play King Solomon and I said look you tell me whose stuffed animal this is or I'm going to cut the baby in half right, and they both as children would do said it's mine, <laughs> so what did this terrible parenting maneuver I cut the this puppy in half and they devolved into tears right they were hysterical and about that time i'm holding the scissors and the stuffed animal my children are crying heather walks through the door and the look on her face is like what is going on here and when i saw her face i realized like oh no i just did something really really bad that was really terrible right and i made this horrible parenting mistake you know and now you know, 20 years later or 15 years later with my kids, like we still laugh about that story that dad's not perfect. Dad, like so misapplied scripture. Like I literally, I literally applied scripture to my children right. and it blew up, um, blew up our family. You know, like it was so sad, so comical. And that stuffed animal is still in a baggie in Heather's sewing closet, not yet put together, right? Like it's still the story of humanness and clumsiness. And I would much rather my children know me as a human and being able to love me and me love them and our clumsiness and our imperfections and our humanity, because that's how, that's how Christ loves me. That's how God loves me. That's how the Spirit moves through me. This well, is a clumsy, imperfect human, right? And, not only is this a great resource for parents, but for grandparents oh, that are yes. more involved today with their young grandchildren than ever before. The book is called Parenting with Heart how imperfect parents and grandparents can raise resilient, loving, and wise-hearted kids. Stephen James, Chip Dodd. Stephen James, thank you. We've run out of time, but it's been a pleasure and honor to have you here with us on Revealing the Truth. It's been great being with you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.